Good evening to all the participants and happy morning to the speakers. On behalf of CNSCA, I extend my warm wishes and welcome all the participants for today's study series. You have been a wonderful source of support and inspiration for CNSCA to conduct the study series. We routinely utilize computers, smartphones, and tablets for many of our intimate communications. They have become so user-friendly and easy to operate. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and smartphones have enabled us to transcend distance like never before. We can now communicate with anyone in the world with a, with a few swipes of our fingers. These innovations have sparked changes in a society almost to the point where we can't imagine modern life without them. While the digital revolution has taken the world by storm, dispute, revolution, dispute resolution systems have been slow to keep pace. Justice remains often bureaucratic, long, costly, and sometimes simply inaccessible. Administration of justice has a history of being delayed and the pandemic has made the situation even worse. Although ADR mechanisms has helped the judiciary to dispose of plethora of cases, it has now become imperative that we need a catalyst to make it even more quicker, more efficient and accessible alternative. In the above context, today's worldwide digital revolution poses unique challenges to the legal community and we are on the brink of an online revolution. As new technologies continually develop, and permeate every aspect of daily life, rules and regulations governing human conduct quickly grow obsolete. Growth of online communication and interconnectivity promotes innovation ways to address legal disputes. Online dispute resolution is one such innovation. As technologies are changing, the way in which people communicate and interact with one another, they will invariably change the way conflicts are resolved. Broadly speaking, online dispute resolution, ODR, is a process of incorporating technology to help facilitate alternate dispute resolution procedures. In addition to addressing a wide range of claims, ODR takes a variety of forms which may vary in line of automation and human supplementation. Fully automated negotiation occurs completely online simple monetary focus claims are resolved through software algorithms and negotiating parties never meet face to face. face to. In, in contrast, online mediation typically occurs in virtual resolution rooms. Conferencing software allows the mediator to communicate live with the parties in chat rooms or over video conference. The benefit of ODR in ADR is enormous Amongst other advantages, it eliminates geographical boundaries, overcomes jurisdictional issues, and delivers quick, economical, and effective solution to disputes. On today's topic, ODR for ADR, we have with us two of the distinguished personalities and immensely learned persons in Dr. Kabir Dugal and Ms. Rekha Rangachari, highly regarded for their erudition and seminal contribution to the field of ADR practices. Persons endowed with high intellect and legal acumen having exceptional grasp of law. May I request a chairperson, Sri D. Saravanan, to welcome today's speaker. Over to you, Saravanan. Thank you, Mr. Ashok, for your opening remarks. And thanks, Mr. Onan, for your wonderful uh, welcome address. Uh, good evening and good morning to all the participants. Alternative dispute resolution is popular as it is faster and less expensive than going to court. However, there is a stalemate both in traditional dispute resolution and alternative dispute resolution on account of the current pandemic. There is a saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Pandemic drives the legal fraternity to find out a way to reinforce the alternative dispute resolution by integrating with technology and online dispute resolution is becoming the pipeline for dispute resolution throughout the world. Therefore, today's topic, ODR for ADR, is very much needed. We have two young stalwarts with us today to share their experience 
as to how ODR works and its benefits. I am so happy to introduce Professor Rekha Rangachari and, and Dr. Kabir Dugar. Rekha is the Executive Director of the New York International Arbitration Center and helps to shape arbitration and dispute resolution practices from a platform in New York on various bar associations, councils, and committees. Prior to joining New York Center, Ms. Rekha was Director of ADR Services for the New York Commercial Division of the American Arbitration Association International Center for Dispute Resolution and received its President Award in the year 2017. She chairs the Arbitration Subcommittee of the New York City Boards in Inter-American Affairs Committee and co-chairs Private International Law Interest Group with Dr. Kabir Dugal at the American Society of International Law. Rekha is also board member of the Association for Conflict Resolution of Greater New York and the New York Coalition of Women's Initiatives. And she is associate editor of the Juries Investment Arbitration Conference volumes and adjunct professor at Sigon All Law School. She enjoys speaking engagement always. I take this opportunity on behalf of all the participants to congratulate Ms. Rekha Rangachari for her very recent nomination as a director in the board of directors of Orbital Woman. The exciting fact about Rekha is prior to law, she was a Bharatanatyam dancer touring with Natya Dance Theater. Dr. Kabir Dugal is an attorney in the New York office of the law firm Arnold and Porter. His practice focuses on international investment arbitration, international commercial arbitration, and public international law, and he has served as both counsel and arbitrator. His experience flows from his triple training in international law, common law, and civil law traditions. The total volume of the disputes he has been involved in exceeds $80 billion. He has facilitated the mediation and negotiation of complex disputes. He is a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School where he teaches international investment law and arbitration, and he is a post director and faculty member for Columbia Law School's Chartered Institute of Arbitrators Comprehensive Course on International Arbitration. Dr. Dugal has received several accolades for his work. He has been ranked as a rising star by Experts Guides in 2019 and was listed as a super lawyer in the New York metro region in 2019. Dr. Dugal has been ranked as among the top 10 arbitrators for the Asia Pacific region by the Bali International Arbitration and Mediation Center in the year 2019. Having said the fun fact about Araka, I must also mention that Kabir can do a yoga headstand and we can ask him to show us when we meet him next in person. Much. Um, Kabir is pulling up our slide deck and I think on behalf of Kabir and I, we really want to say it's it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I was sharing with the organizers, you know, it, it's even more a pleasure, I think, personally, um, to know that there's a center like this in Chennai. I've often looked for one when I've gone back on visits and I'm just thrilled at the body politic you all are creating in dialogue. I had good fun looking through your website and knowing how much you're doing for thought leadership. And it's a testament, I think, to the bar in India and what, what you all are committed to. And frankly, um, I know Kabir and I can learn a lot from, you know, India being a burgeoning landscape where a lot of developments are happening. We are just looking forward to this being the first of many collaborations with you as we learn together. Going to now become also our brand managers. We'll have to talk about uh, fees after this. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but with that, I want to also give the floor to Kabir to, to say a warm hello. Kabir? Thank you, Rekha. Very, very grateful. If I may just add, we are so delighted, we are so honored to be here with you. Uh, we would definitely have much rather been together in person. Uh, Rekha, we should try to go to our Indian restaurant, Saravana Bhavan, to to celebrate over a meal. <laughs> uh, I, you know, we see so many faces. It's a Friday evening. Uh, so we really commend each of you for being here with us. Uh, we're really delighted and we really look forward to having a fun, 
an interactive discussion with all of you. Uh, you know, this is a very timely topic. And so we really commend you for thinking of both the program and of thinking on a topic like this. So thank you very much. Rekha, back to you. Rekha? Sure. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, Shadwaranan said it best, right? These are times for resilience and change. And so that's partially where ODR comes in. Admittedly, there's a lot that we can cover in ODR and we have a short time with you. And so our focus is to talk a lot about virtual hearings and how international arbitration has necessarily had to uh, be resilient um, and even perhaps disruptive in the sense that Although often video conference testimony may have been um, allowed, less so for actual hearings to run fully in virtual. We're going to talk through sort of the models of that, concerns that are coming out of it, um, but we can't stress enough, you know, you all are here and we're just, we're so delighted to see all of your faces. Um, I guess for ease of communication, if we can encourage you, submit comments, submit queries into the Q&A portal, uh, into the chat portal, as you've been doing, because, you know, Kabir and I talk to each other all the time, we're good friends, but the goal is to talk to all of you and to respond to, to insights that you have as well, so we learn together, um, and not just a lecture format. Um, so with that, uh, we'll go on to the next slides, um, and we're just going to go back and forth here, have a dialogue, and invite you to join us. Um, Okay, so our first joke, perhaps it's dry, it's early morning for us here. <laughs> How are international arbitrations conducted? BC, not to be confused, we're talking before COVID. So here are our options. As you all know, of course, often fraught with lots of paper. Um, I don't know, I'll make a note here. Kabir and I are also on the steering committee of the Green Pledge. The goal to try to take things also virtual, to minimize paper um, as one example, as well as many other things to limit our carbon footprint. Um, but, you know, of course, travel, paper, motions, timelines, you know, as you all know well, arbitration has um, come under fire in recent times because although it was created as a means to be more economical and efficient, words that we're supposed to live by, it hasn't always lived up to that task, um, especially in the international arena. And so I think in pandemic, many of us have been thinking, how do we go back to highlighting the real benefits of arbitration, especially where there's been a spotlight on arbitration, because in pandemic, courts have been closed. So to get resolution of disputes, arbitration has necessarily been the avenue. Kabir? Sure. Thank you, Rekha. Uh, you know, I think in most international arbitration proceedings, right, you had a lot of exchanges of documents that were often done by paper, but you also had a lot of travel, right? And the travel took a variety of different dimensions, right? You often traveled to the place where your client was. And, you know, it's not uncommon for, you know, in my, in my own career, you know, I have done work for India and, you know, I had to travel from the U.S. to India. Uh, that is a 16-hour flight. Uh, you know, you, if you're talking about what Rekha said, talking about the carbon footprint, there is a huge carbon footprint with travel. There is a huge cost associated with the travel, right? Uh, imagine if we didn't have COVID or as Rekha just said, imagine life BC, right? this event would likely have happened in person. Now, Rekha and I would much rather have been there with you, but avenues like this are possible. These were just not things that we had explored. You know, we always thought it was necessary to be present in person. So that was the second reality. There was a lot of paper, there was a lot of travel. Rekha, you worked at the AAA ICDR. How did you see the process? Was it super simple or were there a lot of motions? Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, we, we also, I guess, will disclose, right? We're practitioners, as you know, in the U.S. And so there often was a lot of extended um, extensions in general, a lot of motions, cross motions, um, uh, summary summary judgment pleadings as well that often were didn't, didn't help towards the process. Um, and so... 
even where you have streamlined arbitration rules, administered arbitration rules, with, with set out timelines, right, uh, where par party autonomy rules an arbitration, and the parties have this robust advocacy they believe they have to offer, <laughs> it, it's always possible in many instances, rather, to extend deadlines. We'll get, we'll get more to that and what are concerns in, in virtual and in pandemic, but um, I think often arbitral institutions really want to try to streamline the process, but advocacy sometimes gets in the way. Um, and so how, how do we go back to reminding ourselves uh, the genesis of why ADR was so successful at the beginning? Okay, with that, Drake, how have things changed for us? What do you see as the differences that are happening post-BC, right? What do you see points for consideration? Can you walk us through some of those? Yep, and so we've covered several of these, but you know, we believe in the repetition of it because this is so much of what our life looks like right now access to justice, as I've already mentioned, and you all know well, the courts have been closed across different jurisdictions. Courts are slowly starting to open. I'll pause it to you in New York. They are opening and in the US in general, and they're running in virtual under different sets of platforms that they believe are better uh, to ward against cybersecurity threats. Um, and so in general though, while we've been in pandemic, the only way really to file pleadings have been e e-filings with arbitral institutions. And I'll admit to you in talking to many of the arbitral institutions, including ones that where Indian parties are active, like SEAC, filings in general for commercial filings are up. Uh, most institutions are actually doing very well right now <laughs> in spite of being in pandemic. Um, and so, you know, as Kabir said, this elimination of cost and travel, it goes towards the efficiency components that we keep talking about. Admittedly, as you may all know already, you can't sit in a virtual hearing um, as long as you could maybe a 12 hour day if you were live with everyone there. And so it pushes everyone to take, I think, these shorter breaks to be more thoughtful. Um, I've often heard from many say uh, there's less of this preponderance of um, just grandstanding dialogue and rather you have to get to the point because everyone is very cautious of when everything is supposed to end as well. And of course, you know, I think a lot of international practitioners are also saying their body feels better overall because they're not having to be flexible to different time zones to fly and immediately go into hearing. Um, it, and it's saving on a lot of cost, you know, so how can that cost be redirected? It's a cost savings to the client, something that they always like to hear, particularly the in-house folks who are managing that cost portfolio. Um, the geographic reality, I mean, I think this is true, be it for virtual programs, much like this one, or for virtual hearings. The limitation is, if you're trying to do it across multiple time zones, who necessarily wins and gets the preferential treatment by time zone? Um, I would posit, I think we're all working more now than we did uh, pre-pandemic or BC, um, because you know, time is immemorial. It just keeps blending into the next day. And frankly, Kabir and I often talk about the weekend feels much like the weekday for same cadence. Um, logistical challenges, as, as you can appreciate, we're gonna go into a bit more into this um, soon. Um, they're noted here and, and Kabir, will you take us through what are these challenges? What are issues there with? Sure. I mean logistics for making the virtual real virtual reality successful is our ability to improvise right you look at some of these platforms right and just think of how these platforms were even a year ago you see that they have really risen to the challenge they have adapted they have modified themselves they've given us new options for example zoom the platform that we're using right here right there is an option you can create breakout rooms. Now, this is something you can do virtually where, you know, parties can get together in a virtual room to talk among themselves. You would otherwise do this in person, right? We call them virtual rooms, uh, breakout rooms. 
They were also, I think, in the US at least, called as the war room, which I think is just a very colorful expression to describe what I think people think is happening in that room. Uh, it's mostly people just complaining, this arbitrator isn't listening to us. Uh, but we're adapting. It's helping us make things flexible. Uh, you know, see, on the whole, a reality like we are in currently, right? You're broadcasting something on Facebook. You have people who are dialing in from all over the world. We have the host sitting in Chennai at a different time zone. We're in New York in a different time zone. If I may also add, thank you for doing this in the morning. It incentivizes me to purify myself. As Rekha mentioned, right, our days and nights are bleeding into each other. So having events that force me to shave, to get ready, much appreciated. Uh, but just coming back to a point, right? Technology is adapting. Technology is trying to help us make things become as user-friendly as possible to adapt to the realities of having a hearing. Now, this is not to suggest that everything is going to be totally smooth, that everything is totally easy. There are concerns, right? Rika, do you want to start telling us what some of these concerns might be? Maybe you walk us through the first two and I'll walk through the other two. That's perfect. You know, I wanted to drop a footnote too. You know, we're all learning in real time. And I say that because the preferred uh, platform has been Zoom. And I invite you to look even at these um, centers that have come up, particularly in pandemic, virtual platforms. Many of them embed Zoom into their reality and build from it. Right. The truth is Zoom came under fire, as you may know, end-to-end -end encryption, Zoom bombing, um, and the like. Very scary. And actually, most recently, at a board meeting in Atlanta, I was hearing they were running a conference, and just horrible things happened because somehow that link was posted publicly. You know, it goes to be a constant reminder, right? These platforms exist. They're adapting in real time to concerns from stakeholders like us. The more we use them, the more we run into issues. Um, and I know Zoom, for example, in India is not, you know, the, the preferred platform generally. Um, you know, it's WebEx or it's other items. But, you know, what are the real issues? Who's causing concern? Is it safe? Then there's just a misnomer out there. I, I think there's a lot of, you, you know, interesting conversations we can have. Um, Going specific, oh, and I guess I wanted to note also, you know, as, as we're all learning in real time, I, I just posit to you something to think about, um, you know, as we talk about considerations. There's one idea that has come out um, of Singapore, this idea of asynchronous hearings, as we're talking about eliminating cost and travel, how best do you adapt to time zone realities when there are multiple parties across multiple jurisdictions. And so Michael Huang posited this idea that I think he borrowed um, from one of the Chinese courts of, and, and whether it's possible or not, I, I posit to you to think about, but whether um, an arbitrator or a tribunal can run proceedings first with one party, um, all virtually and, and recorded, uh, the other party has access to that, then the other party goes at the time most convenient, then, and all the pleadings are submitted online in a cloud, and then, as needed, the tribunal reconvenes everybody for a more limited uh, virtual hearing. Whether this is the way of the future, whether there are major due process concerns, I think naturally leads us into our next portion. What are key concerns in general we're seeing in virtual? Witness coaching is one of them, right? Usually we're in a room, you can see the witness, you see what they have access to, you see if, <laughs> if somebody is giving them signals. Um, and, and so a lot of virtual platforms actually have started to introduce a 365 degree camera. Right. So in order and before the witness starts speaking, they have to have that camera on enabled and you can see the full room. It's the way that you can see if they're somehow referencing documents that everyone is not aware of or looking at them on their computer. Um, it's also the way that you can see that nobody else is in the room guiding their dialogue. And it sounds funny to say, right, we're all practitioners. We believe in the rule of law. But the truth is, we don't, we don't know how to guarantee that. And where we have fears, technology comes into play to hopefully swage those fears, limit them, <laughs> uh, and, and give us better sense. And, and so I've, with humor, I've, I've heard from witnesses saying, 
now I have to tidy this room up in whole because, <laughs> you know, you're beaming in from your home. It's a much more personal reality. Um, and not everyone's home is equipped to, you know, have their home office and be, have the luxury of beaming in from a, a lovely setup. And, and I note that because I'm beaming in from my niece's bedroom. She's seven years old and like there's fabulous artwork on the, on the walls, better artwork than I could do at my age. Um, but <laughs> it just goes to show, I think we're all in a very interesting place. Another item before I turn it back to Kabir is this idea of safe and good connection. I mean, it's something we know there is, many of the arbitral institutions have come out with different guidance protocols. Um, and I'm happy to share that with you after this call. Um, NIAC is a clearinghouse. We collected all of those and have tried to update in real time because there's so much out there. Um, and so if you're ever wondering, you know, where do I go? That's a great starting point. There's some 20 institutions that have submitted protocols. Separate from that though, right? Good internet. I mean, it's something we know, but some of these protocols are also citing to um, items to think about like channels, bandwidth and bridging. So the Seoul protocol out of uh, the center in Korea does that as well as the African American um, African Arbitration Academy. Um, and, and they're talking in general about full network security, audio and video encryption, things that we know, but sometimes you don't always know where to start with that, right? We're lawyers, we're not technical experts necessarily. And so these are really great guides um, as uh, minimum parameter bandwidth realities. Kabir, can you take us through the rest, please? Thank you. Thank you, Reka. I mean, I would urge you all just to give a slight plug to Reka's resources that she makes available. They are really outstanding. Uh, you know, she also sends a weekly update every Friday. Reka has not paid me money to say this, but <laughs> it really gives you up-to-date information. So I would, I would urge you, you know, to take a look at it. On this point of internet connections, you know, uh, I'm part of a team that's running a, a weekly webinar series where we interview different arbitrators. And you know, we have had arbitrators from Nigeria, we had from India, we had from Mexico, and we had no problems with the internet. And then we had a speaker from Paris and a speaker from London, and the internet for both of them crashed. So it's just one of those things, you know, you never know how internet's going to work. Uh, but we will talk a little bit subsequently about how do you address these practical realities so just put a pin there for right now but we also talk about technology and how we need to adapt ourselves how we need to get familiar with technology uh, right if you're doing things virtually you need to know how zoom works you need to know how to share your screen you need to know how to share your screen and not put your email up accidentally which has happened you need to know how you use the chat function and in the chat function, you don't say something to everybody. These people suck. All these are realities that have happened, right? Rick has spoke about this, Zoom bombing. Now I am doing a, a, you know, a doctoral degree here in the US and it actually started in these schools. The problem, what was called as Zoom bombing, right? That somebody got access to the link. They came into the room and it was very often that they would start playing pornography. Now, unless you are a very special kind of a person, that is very traumatizing, right? You're going there to study law and suddenly you're learning not law, right? Now Zoom has come up with a lot of techniques to prevent that, but these are realities you have to be thinking about, right? In an arbitration, right? If you're talking about very sensitive information, if you're talking about Confidential things, if somebody is able to hack in, right? If your system isn't secure, if the encryption isn't safe and somebody is able to get access, that's clearly defeating the entire purpose of arbitration. And finally, we're going to come to the issue of due process, right? Arbitration, like any judicial process, is going to be effective if it ensures that everybody who is participating in it is given a fair opportunity to be heard, is given a fair opportunity you know, to present their case, there's equal equality of arms, right? If we are not able to guarantee that, 
the point of having a virtual hearing or indeed of having any hearing is lost. This, look, the first three points we spoke, you know, we have tried to come to solutions. We can, we can address them, right? For internet, you can have a backup. Technology, spend some time on it. Witness coaching, you know, Reka said, you know, do cameras, do a 365 degrees room suite. There are ways you can accomplish it. Due process really presents the biggest challenge, right? If you think of the New York Convention on the enforcement of awards, right? Broadly, one of the bases to challenge an award is if due process is not respected. We will spend some time now talking about due process. I think it's that significant. Rika, can I, can I pass, pass the floor back to you? And you can tell us actually how due process has manifested itself by looking at some real life cases. Perhaps you can take us through what happened in Bolivia. Sure. You know, and, and I'm sure you're hearing these increasing concerns about due process, examples being moving forward with virtual hearings on objection of one of the parties, um, requesting extensions. And I think the key I want to underline here, and the Bolivia example brings us to light, what is the way in advocacy we argue for those extensions or those violations of due process? That This is huge. And in the Bolivia case, we'll see it actually works against them based on how they chose to argue. So um, the due process case we're talking about here is um, a case that's under the auspices of the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the PCA. It was a claim that was brought about mining concessions against Bolivia under the US Bolivia BIT. And so um, in trying to file their statement of defense, Bolivia said that it was virtually impossible in pandemic to be able to file at the appropriate deadline. Specifically, their arguments were buttressed by force majeure and um, in possibility of purpose. And this is really the turning point here, right? Because force majeure, as we all know, is a very high standard. Um, whether or not the, the contract itself delineates force majeure and examples therewith, it's a very difficult standard to meet. And, you know, in addition, Bolivia cited to the number of things that we all know, right? I mean, they had a bit more turbulence. Uh, Morales had resigned uh, earlier. Um, and then they also cited to, in general, pandemic, right? We're all going through it, disruption, uh, governments. It, this is between the US and Bolivia bit. The claim was brought under that. So in the US, you know, you have limited operations. Um, but it goes back to this idea, and Kabir will get into the tribunal's reasoning. but. The response back by claimant, right, the, these investors was this idea of unforeseeability um, that, that Bolivia couldn't prove. Is it really unforeseeable? And so um, I, I give you another example in quick is that advocacy in pandemic is something we really have to think about. And the high bars to saying force majeure is what barred the activity because tribunals are increasingly going to look at that under review and apply that high standard. I'll give another example, not like the Bolivia example, but in a recent proceeding that was um, supposed to come before NIAC, it was a big international arbitration matter, multi-billion dollars at stake under the International Chamber of Commerce. Counsel, instead of on behalf of <laughs> their client, counsel itself said, listen, I'm at home, we're supposed to go forward with these hearings. I have four children at home. Now I can lock the door, but there's no guarantee that my, my beautiful children will not somehow wander into the proceedings in the middle of it. Appreciating that this is very high level argument, I would appreciate an extension, right? I mean, it's, it's pulling on the human purse strings, but this is important because that worked, right? Extending a deadline, which is exactly what Bolivia was trying to do, extending the deadline to the statement of claim, is something we do all the time. Either we mutually agree between the parties or we try to make our, uh, our argument towards the tribunal. And usually it's compelling, right? Slight extensions is common in our practice. But here, if you ally it with an argument of force majeure, you may indeed lose. Kabir, can you take us through what the tribunal tells us? Sure, uh, Rika, thank you. And I, I loved what you said, you know. Uh, just to emphasize those points, there are two ways to look at this, right? Point one, 
the pandemic has affected all of us, right? There's nobody here who has not been affected or doesn't know someone who has been very severely affected by, by COVID. So it is a global reality. And to that extent, there will be greater empathy, right? Something that affects us all. Uh, there is greater empathy. But this gets to your other point, Reka. It depends on how you argue the case, right? I think the way the argument was put here was probably force majeure. And query whether that was or was not the right decision. Because looking at the arguments that were made by the party, the tribunal says, da-da-da, wait for it. The tribunal says, look, pandemic, new reality. We agree with that. We know that there are new demands and it is difficult. We acknowledge that. But then they go forward and say that, hey, people are adjusting to this new reality. And that was the ultimate finding. Now the query, now we're in the hypothetical realm, right? Perhaps if a party had put the argument slightly differently, you didn't couch it under the bucket of force majeure uh, against the bucket of um, impossibility, but you'd really couched it as a human appeal to a reality. If you're in lockdown, right? Council was in Paris. Paris had a lockdown. Council was in New York. New York had a lockdown. Bolivia had a political crisis and a lockdown. If you just, I guess, had not couched it under these buckets, the query is whether the outcome would have been different. Don't know. This is where we stand out to. Now, this had also happened relatively early. I think this order is from April. Uh, the tribunal was not persuaded in this present instance. So that's where we are. This is just one instance. Now, this is an investor state case. We're probably going to look at few instances of COVID and how COVID has impacted. We, the examples we are giving are investor state and the reason for that is just investor state cases tend to be in the public domain. So bear with us for a few minutes just because of this reality. Uh, Rekha, do we see actually an increase in potential cases in response to government actions, right? That's what investor state cases are, right? You have a treaty between states. If there is a state action, then you can bring an arbitration claim, right? Are we seeing potentially a rise in pandemic claims in response to governmental action? What has your experience been? Yeah, I mean, we're going to take another example of, of this. And, and I guess I, I just want to keep underscoring, you know, we're all learning in pandemic that includes the tribunal. Listen, some tribunals, as you know, have lived through, or you all have done it yourselves, lived through so many other crises and been resilient. Not everyone um, has had to withstand that. And so, you know, whether it's Zoom learning to end-to-end -end encryption, whether it's tribunals learning on objection from one party, um, the efficacy of the process and how they can ensure that they move things forward, um, it goes towards this query we're always having um, as it relates to hearings and deadlines. What is really guaranteed in an ADR format? Are parties in somehow in some manner guaranteed in-person hearings or should virtual be able to be sufficient um, against any due process concerns so long as parties are able to put forward their cases in chief. And so it's just something that, you know, we invite you to keep thinking about as we each keep learning. This example here in um, Peru, um, you know, strange things are happening as uh, we all withstand pandemic. And countries, uh, I posit to you, are also learning <laughs> or trying to figure it out um, in instability. So here, you may have heard about this case in Peru, right? This idea of an emergency, Peru suspended collection of tolls. It, this started in the first week of April, so early on in pandemic, time um, being important. Um, and it's important to note, too, that there are several concessionaires throughout Peru um, that run these tolls. So in total, let's say there are about 74, 75 toll roads in Peru. 24 were run by state-owned entities, right? So they adhered to the state of emergency um, that Peru put out and the suspension of collecting tolls. 32 
um, in addition to that, decided voluntarily to stop collecting tolls, which leaves a little under 20 operators, right, to understand what they're dealing with. It's a unilateral change by government in their contract in a state of emergency. The queries that also readily present themselves is what is a state of emergency? What is the duration of the state of emergency? Uh, Peru in particular declared two states of emergency, a health emergency right at the get-go in early March, as well as a national emergency in light of the fact that they had tolling cases. I think right now Peru has some 4,500 cases um, with several deaths therewith. You know, we all know this. We all know these horrible stats across the globe and for our separate jurisdictions. Um, but these are really important. How long will the state of emergency last? And, and then what does that mean for investors that don't voluntarily comply? What are the main issues that will come out of it? Um, and, you know, this isn't a new thing for Peru. Peru is, you know, facing claims currently pre-pandemic of Spanish investors on the Pan-American highway issues therewith. Um, so, <laughs> you know, Peru's in dialogue about its roads in general now exacerbated by uh, stopping collection of tolls. What will the result be? Real time will tell. These are, you know, again, um, there'll be generally ISDS claims because they can be brought under the bit. We don't know. We'll have to wait and see because they haven't been filed yet. Um, so they may indeed be in the public domain, as Kabir was saying, and that's why we take these examples as ones that we can talk about because the documents are readily available for you. So I encourage you, not only as you may follow the Peru example, but for Bolivia, those documents are available. And so if you're interested more about the arguments that were made and then the full decision of the tribunal, do take a look. Kabir, back to you. Thank you, Rika. Uh, Rika spoke about Peru, and I'm going to give another example. It's again from Latin America, and this is an example of Mexico, right? Now, again, here you are seeing that there are severe restrictions being placed by governments in Mexico. The government is going to start putting restrictions on renewable energy production, right? The renewable energies in the investor state space has been something that has given rise to a lot of cases, right? It is one of those industries where you have to put a lot of investment. There's going to be several years where you don't make any return and then you start seeing some return, right? Governments very often want to invite you to, to, to make investments because of the heavy upfront costs that are associated with it. But then reality steps in. You have crisis, right? You, have, you had the financial crisis in the past. Now we have COVID and so the government is stepping back. How does the company react to it? Uh, we know in Mexico that there is a suggestion being put forward that, you know, the government's decision to rescind these these activities and to put restrictions on them uh, violate obligations under the treaty. Now, we yet don't know whether these threats are going to materialize, but these are threats. These are realities that a government has to think about, right? What do we focus on? How do we go about it? How is our decision-making process? These are complex questions. Uh, you know, so we are seeing one way COVID is impacting arbitration, that is government measures are under scrutiny. Uh, query, and this is something you all can think about, you know, India has had a fairly severe lockdown. Uh, whether we think India's obligations might be in any way susceptible to claims, that's an open query, something to think about. Uh, I just want to point out that these actions by investors have led some very prominent bodies to critique arbitration at large. Now, the critiques are on investor state arbitration. Point is whether that may even relate to commercial arbitration. Rika, uh, do you want to walk us through and tell us what do you see happening, for example, by some bodies actually here in New York? Yeah. 
Well, so this is just, you know, a fine point to say bodies are coming out. They're calling for a hard stop on the filing of claims in, in times of emergency, particularly by investors, um, because, you know, governments also themselves declaring states of emergency are not able to handle these. As we said before, we're all figuring it out. What does that mean under a legal rubric? It's difficult to say. And the truth is that as we emerge from pandemic, hopefully sooner than later, there's going to be a major uptick in filings as, um, you know, there are different claims of frustration of purpose. This is the truth, right? But do we need to file those now to preserve necessary timelines or can it wait? Um, and, and often, you know, deadlines are tolling, um, but where a state of emergency exists, it, it there with puts a moratorium on deadlines because national courts are not open and available to its constituents. Um, I, I query whether, you know, different groups are putting out things like this that you see on the screen. Um, what will the impact be? Is, is it just good to have it as part of dialogue, whether we should be filing these claims? And so I will say, I laud in general tribunals, um, excuse me, institutions like this one for making us think. I think in pandemic, we all have to really consider best practices. Um, we are under a duty con to consider best practices, not only for our clients, but for how the law is going to evolve and our practice is going to evolve. Um, but this is one example. And whether it's really difficult to assess impact of statements like this by groups, but admittedly, you know, this group is one example. They have a lot of gravitas in the community based in New York. They have a lot of, you know, academics um, and stakeholders as part of their cadre. Will it work? Does it matter? It's really questions that you all will consider as we keep redefining our practice. Thank you, Rekha. Back to you, Kabir. Thank you, thank you. This is the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment. It's a body that's affiliated with the Columbia Law School and with the Earth Institute here in New York City. Kabir, any affiliation between you and this group as a lecturer in law at Columbia? I mean, they are an autonomous body affiliated with the law school, but I do work closely with them, you know? So, so to that extent, there is an affiliation. <laughs> They're giving us three reasons as to why they think there must be a moratorium on investor state arbitration. And again, just something to think about. Generally, the debate starts in investor state and then bleeds into commercial. So keep this in the back of your mind. Will we find similar arguments potentially moving into commercial? Query for all of you. But the three reasons that they give is that they're going to be a number of unjustified claims. That's their first point. The second point is that, you know, priorities. They're saying governments should focus their attention on the crisis, right? Uh, that's the second point. And then the third point is these awards can be significant, right? These investor state cases often are in the high millions or in billions of dollars, right? Now, if you're going to start asking a government to take this money and give it in awards, uh, you know, what impact will that have on the government's ability to address crisis? Now, I'll just pause here for a moment because in the United States, there was the enforcement of a potential award. This is an award of, against the Central American country of Guatemala. And the case was brought by an investor, Teco. Uh, so they get a successful investor state award. They've gone to enforce it. And Guatemala's awards before the courts in the United States was, you know, hey, let us focus on the pandemic. Let us focus on taking care of our people. Right? So we're already seeing some of these arguments materializing. The query again for us to think about is, what impact will this have on arbitration at large? So that's where we are right now. Uh, Rika, do you want to tell us now, just moving on from these examples, uh, what problems do we see with online mediation? And then we'll talk about online arbitration because we are trying to promote this as the way forward, right? For the reasons we spoke about initially. Uh, are there problems? when you're trying to mediate an international dispute. Do you want to talk us through some of these points, Rekha? On to you. 
Sure. And, you know, it's towards this point. No system is perfect, just like no lawyer is perfect, although we try to be. And so, you know, what are issues that we're going to face in virtual, particularly in mediation, because the concerns are different than those in arbitration. Um, you know, we often talk about in general in ADR, veracity of a witness's testimony, the ability to glean their reactions, to see their body language. Um, and this is difficult in virtual, right? Um, it's one of the hardships separate and apart from, <laughs> um, you know, what does the platform look like? Can you always and constantly see the witness? Because there was an issue um, in some cases where um, they didn't have the kind of layout where you could see all necessary parties. And so the camera, um, it didn't allow the setting that you could maintain everyone. And so rather it flipped uh, from presenter to presenter. That can be an issue where the attorney is asking the question, and the witness is responding, but there's a lag in getting to their visibility. Um, and, and so, you know, we just pause it. Now, this is less of a concern, right? The systems have adapted to make sure that we have this fabulous layout view and we can see everybody as needed. Um, but can we fully appreciate uh, what the witness is saying? It goes more, I guess, to that question too of how important, how much uh, importance is placed on witness testimony overall. Um, I think in mediation, especially where resolution of the dispute is a focus, it, it can be huge. Jika, if I could step in here for a minute, I just wanted to see your reaction because we are told actually camera sometimes can capture a person's face much more closely. Sorry, that was creepy. But, you know, you can see a person much more closely than perhaps you could, you know, if you're in a setting and the witness is sitting several miles away, right? What, what is your reaction to that? Do you think this is an effective way? Does, does video really in some senses help? You know, here, as with many things, it's that proverbial answer. Well, it depends. <laughs> you know, if, if, if we're trained to be able to sit in front of a camera, stay poised, smile, be calm, you know, you're, you're arguably going to succeed even in virtual. But what distractions might you have behind you, around you? you you know, what's on your screen? Are you set up? You know, there are lots of these different, you may have seen them, um, layouts that different firms um, and different platforms are suggesting as best use. You know, you have three monitors. You have one that has your transcript, one that has the actual platform and the video screen, and, and then another that is for your documents. Does everyone have access to at least three screens where you can have that ability? Um, so I really, I really think it depends, which is not a, you know, very satiating answer, but it's life and it's the truth. Um, you know, and so, and here's where also things like bandwidth and other things come into play, because if you're not able to quickly get the witness's testimony, be it in mediation or in arbitration, and there's a lag that really in mediation can defeat the process where everyone is coming to the table, trying to figure it out trying to minimize egos, figuring out, you know, what the, what the issues are, are enumerated. I will say that I think it's a bigger issue in general um, in mediation, but I'm curious, you know, to, as we move into arbitration and Kabir will take us through that, if you could posit sort of your comments and insights in the chat, I'm, I'm just so curious to hear how you all are adapting and dealing with this virtual reality, which isn't fantastic for some, you know, it, it's that joke of it's, it's professional on top and party on the bottom, but like we're going forward and, and how are we doing it? And I, I think addressing concerns and, and struggles we all have, because this is new to all of us, is helpful to be able to do it in dialogue. But Kabir, uh, tell us, so arbitration, is it different? Is it the same? What do you think? Thank you, Rika. I think these are points we have spoken about, right? Uh, but, but we see some similarities to mediation, some slight differences because of the nature of, of arbitration, right? I think witness coaching remains a very serious issue. Now, everybody can see me. Everyone can see my two beautiful Indian paintings behind. Everyone can see my orange wall behind. You don't see what's in front of me. You don't know if somebody is dancing in front of me. You don't know if somebody has placards in front of me. Uh, we can do a virtual sweep, but what if somebody comes in subsequently, right? These ideas are not certain at this stage. So 
that remains a challenge that remains something we need to we need to adapt with and keep considering uh, the other point is just we have to adapt to realities of how do you do a hearing right very often in bc right if you had a witness for cross examination you gave them a big binder that was tabbed uh, you know those were the documents you were going to show the witness you would tell them go to this page look at this paragraph and you asked your question how do you do that now do you share your screen now sharing the screen works wonderfully but when you have to share 30 documents trust me the sharing screen function doesn't work very well so are we required then to mail a hard copy that is broken you know the seal is broken these are realities we are going to have to struggle with right now another point here is just the chat function look it's wonderful when we're having a webinar to get your comments it's wonderful we encourage it if you're having a hearing that's not ideal right you don't like the idea that people could be chatting with one another you know every time somebody posts a message a box pops up right you also have to think about things like are you going to record it are you not going to record it if you're going to record it where is it going to be stored if there is confidential information there are concerns what if i have a webcam and somebody is recording the whole hearing these are all challenges we have to confront right cyber security data compliance these are again issues that have attracted a lot of attention bc these were significant issues before covid covid has only brought these issues to the forefront the more we are thinking about moving virtual right so these are some issues we have with us here now let's try to just perhaps spend a few minutes and i know we are probably getting close to the end of our time but perhaps we can talk a little bit about tips uh, this is something reka has been mentioning you know that there's no perfect answer yet but these are some best practices that have come up rika do you want to tell us a little bit about tips i know we're going to have this as a dialogue but why don't you take it over yeah sure and you know mindful of time too if you all uh will give us the privilege of staying with you a few moments after we have earmarked we said 1 hour and uh it is uh we have 2 minutes to go so instead of speed talking um if you'll allow us a few extra minutes it's it's just such a pleasure kabir and i are holding on to it um i i guess i wanted to note as we talk about um successes and tips you know necessarily uh there is that di difference in mediation and arbitration and i'm just responding to the comment that was posited in the chat right the focus in mediation tends to be on the witness um versus in the arbitration it tends to be on on the counsel and advocacy and so it, it, we straddle this issue regardless of you're in mediation or you're in arbitration um a lot of the commentary that's coming out from counsel is it's really difficult towards advocacy and oral advocacy and to be my best to do it in virtual and so how do we achieve that um i guess in more limited perhaps in cross examination which i know you know in the us is something that we're often touted with oh uh the practitioners in cross but it's very difficult to do direct or cross um in virtual um that being said so these successes for online communication it's things that you all know and so i'll just run through them um quickly have a platform that's accessible and it addresses what you need always have a backup because invariably the first option will fail um a set schedule this is important of course and i think tribunals are really trying to hold people to it with built in breaks often the commentary we're hearing is shorter breaks it's much quicker where you don't have to wait in line necessarily depending on where you're sheltering in place to go to the bathroom uh and come back <laughs> there are less people to have a coffee chat with in the hallway um maybe uh but but things to think about right these timelines um the order very important right even as we're here having here kabir and i keep tossing this proverbial microphone back and forth between us and you know i think it helps when you know somebody very well kabir and i are good friends but you know when you're in a very formal hearing this is important you know what is the order of the speakers what is their delineated time will they stick to it what happens if they run over and how does the tribunal control that process um 
Also, obviously, we do this in natural in hearings, but in virtual, identifying the speaker so it's clear on the record for the court reporter. Um, and then in general, right, techniques. This is something I already highlighted, but it's difficult and we need to practice and run dress rehearsals in virtual. You all know this. I've been having increasingly dress rehearsals, even for virtual programs, to avoid speaking over one another, even when there's a clear schedule, because you think of an idea that percolates. It's timely. You want to say it. You don't want to have to posit it in the chat, if the chat is secure. So how do you do that and maintain this robust dialogue um, or advocacy if we're looking only at hearings. Um, so what are the types of questions? Um, and then I think this is a really important point. It's the last bullet on the page. This idea of summation. We do it all the time in practice without thinking twice about it. But in virtual, where there could be any number of issues that detract from our oral advocacy, what is that quick summation to make sure that you're conveying to the tribunal your salient points and that they got it, right? Um, and so it helps, obviously, as Kabir said, you get really into the screen, you're focused on them right here, but it's also that you need to be seeing what they're saying. And so some tips counsel have said is, take the tribunal screens and you, you enlarge um, their faces and perhaps you get a better read. Who knows, but we're all in it. <laughs> We're all in it to win it, arguably, for our clients. Um, but with that, Kabir, take us through some other tips and tricks. Sure, and just if I may add, uh, you know, Rekha and I last night decided to do a dress rehearsal. So we got, we, we, we logged in at nine in the night, New York time. Uh, you know, Rekha was obviously, as always, very immaculate in her dress and her hair. I was in my PJ. Yes, but we still did do a dry run. Uh, Rekha, was there too much information? No, I think it's perfect. We're becoming friends here, right? So <laughs> all of us. So we, we, we are following what we're talking about when we say the dress rehearsal. And that takes us to the final, final, we're getting towards the end. You know, what are some technical tips? Test your system, right? You want to make sure everything works to your dress rehearsal. Uh, if you're doing it with the tribunal, don't be in your PJs. Uh, but you know, you want to test and make sure everything works. Like the organizers have very effectively done here, keep mute as the default. It's very, very disturbing when you have sounds, when you have a kid screaming, when you have the phone ringing, when you have the pressure cooker going off. So mute by default is a smart way to go about it. Uh, make sure you have tech support. Now look, a lot of the ODR involves infrastructure. You need to have tech support. You need to have, as Rekha said, three to four screens. The query for me always is, where do you want me to put them in my New York apartment? But these are realities, right? If you're going to do it virtually, might as well invest to make sure it can work smoothly, right? You do save by not having to travel. Have backup options. I have my computers, but I'm just sharing. I have my phone, my work phone and my personal phone. In case something went wrong, you have an option ready. I can log on to Zoom here and we can pick it up, right? Uh, the premise here is that, you know, we can increase participation. You can allow more people to get into arbitration. So diversity may increase. And the final point is don't use a virtual background. Right, those are very cool. I, I can't show you my virtual screen now, but I have some very fun virtual screens. But those are very troublesome for a hearing because virtual screens don't show you who's in and around the room. For due process concerns, we're almost always told not to have a virtual background. Uh, another thing, virtual backgrounds tend to drain the bandwidth. So that's another reason why we're told not to use virtual backgrounds. Uh, with that, Rekha, do you want to tell us a little bit now, we're getting to our end, what does the future look like? Sure. Or nay, walk us through it, Rekha. <laughs> well, um, I wanted to just add, you know, I posited this institutional resource uh, within the chat function. It's what exists for NIAC um, that we as a clearinghouse have compiled. If it's useful, I'll also share it uh, with Shadavanan and Anand's um, help with the distribution list. Um, but again, I guess I'll posit 
we really love these kinds of forums because it's a starting point to a conversation and for us to become colleagues. And so our hope is that you will stay in touch with us. Uh, you know, our profiles are readily available on a quick Google search, as I know yours are. Um, but I really, I'm really looking forward to staying engaged with this group, as is Kabir, I know. Okay, the future. You know, what a question, Kabir, to pose to me at the end. I mean, the reality <laughs> is, who knows, right? I will say, as I said earlier, there are new ideas coming up, even in virtual, much like the asynchronous hearing idea I asked you to think about. Is it really workable? Are there even greater due process concerns contingent on things like order? Who gets the benefit of going first where the other side gets to review uh, the video recording and then come back um, in addition to a whole host of other things? Is hybrid hearings the real new, new normal? Um, because we've realized that we don't all have to always meet and for everything. How can we identify where counsel and tribunal can just meet without all of the host of witnesses across different languages and across different jurisdictions? Um, and, and so, and then finally, you know, it's, it's a note um, that Kabir made, but how are we thinking about diversity in international ADR? Um, and I think it's something that's really, you know, I'll admit to you and candidly, it's something I guess we're talking a lot about in the US, um, race and humanity under a different rubric, of course, and without getting into all of that myriad of, of details, but to say it's asking us to really look, take a hard look at how are we dealing with um, racial diversity in arbitration, where I would argue we don't really have it. What does it mean? How do we advance that? How do we get all of the really intelligent and necessary folks, much like all of you, to the table, not just in a regional environment, but in, on an international stage, getting the kinds of appointments that you all deserve, both as mediator and as arbitrator. Access, I think, is one of the biggest things. The issue is that there's so much content out there and we see it even more in virtual and it's really difficult to streamline what we're looking at. You know, it's a barrage of constant, you want that? I'll send it to you by email. Did you see this? Did you see that? Our brains can't actually absorb half of that, uh, especially in a world where we're constantly multitasking. Do we do it well in pandemic? I, I don't know. I posit to you it depends on the day. <laughs> and some days are frankly better than others. Um, but with that, you know, these are all things to think about. But it, it underscores the fact pandemic has taught us we can do a ton more than we ever thought possible if made to. It's taught us how to be resilient on online platforms and to teach our arbitrators and mediators also how to be resilient. Will folks still fear the breakout rooms and the sanctity and security of a breakout room and choose instead to go via WhatsApp or to go via FaceTime or iChat or the like because they don't trust the portal and their confidential conversation? Maybe, many people tell me that they don't trust it still. But okay, at least we've gotten to the virtual platform. At least we get the luxury of meeting together like this. And certainly the next time we meet that we do it in Chennai <laughs> um, <laughs> at a time agreeable. Um, but Kabir, tell us. So, you know, you pose the hard question to me, but what does the future look like to you, you know, as an academic, as an arbitrator, as a practitioner? I think I'm optimistic, you know, as, as a species, as humankind, we keep adjusting to realities. So I hope you're able to adjust and come out stronger. Uh, you know, I was speaking to my mom and she tells me she has never experienced anything like this. Uh, you know, she's been around for some time. <laughs> so, so we're all adjusting to this new reality. Uh, yeah, we, together we are stronger. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think resilience, we've shown it. And, and to all of you who are doing it, you know, I, I think we'll keep doing it. And hopefully we won't get amnesia when we come out of pandemic to go back to our old ways because then it would all be for naught. Um, and so with that, let, let's figure it out together as we straddle uh, jurisdictions um, because we're in, we're in this field to do exactly that, to be innovative. Rekha and I love using GIFs, by the way. So we thought it's a <laughs> to end with minions. <laughs> okay, I'll stop the screen share. Uh, yeah.
leave it to you for uh, questions and yeah. answers. Uh, I think uh, Rekha and yourself both, uh, especially Rekha's, uh, most of the uh, questions she has, uh, which were in the chat box, was answered by her then and there. Um, there were uh, a few which had come out uh, to me in private chat. Uh, I will take that. Uh, and uh, now I think Saronin has posted two questions. You can answer, uh, one of you all can answer that also. What do what does ODR exactly mean? Conducting the whole arbitration in exclusive ODR portal or exchange of pleadings uh, through email and uh, holding uh, oral hearing through video conferencing. What is it actually? Can I take the first stab at this? this sure, actually, I was going to tell you to do it. <laughs> but, well, it resonates with a conversation I was just recently having with um, an engineer and lawyer who builds ODR platforms. And so we were talking about what does ODR mean, exactly what the question asks. Online dispute resolution. I think it um, underscores this idea that the whole proceeding runs online. That means all communications, all submissions are uploaded to the cloud, much of which we do already, but full communication only via the portal. So, um, and that's an interesting concept, right? I will admit that we sliced off one piece of what that is, this virtual reality, because Kabir and I think the issues there with are really concerning, um, and also the due process concerns, which are close to our hearts, um, as we talk about the rule of law. But Ideally, ODR, if it were to function in full, is everything is online. Um, you know, and is it a misnomer then to only talk about virtual hearings? I would posit to you that any piece uh, that's online is one step towards success of ODR. There are a whole host of uh, platforms that are encouraged for use, many institutions to actually run their online proceedings fully online um, have created bespoke platforms. And we're seeing this in the US, for example, in consumer cases where not only the arbitrator is selected at random through a scrolling system where it selects um, a neutral person to run the case, but then everything is shifted to the online platform. Um, and so I query to you, uh, what does it mean? How can you adapt it in your practice? Can you actually move everything virtually? And I think it was um, Shadavanan who highlighted this or, or perhaps Anand in the opening remarks of um, where communication back and forth is done um, virtually in the cloud. I query to you though, you know, the difficulty there, and I see it a lot in mediation, and it goes back to that, is human um, perception always accurate? In the same way that when you read a text message from a friend and you can read into that message any number of ways how does it up the ante if we're now taking it into dispute resolution and we're only going by email posited emails posited back and forth to understand full intent meaning and otherwise and maybe towards advocacy it forces us to be more concise to be less colorful um, but understanding that there are always multiple meanings to different words and, and, you know, if we're doing it in different languages, we all know certain words take on wholly different meanings in context than others. Um, so I think it's why ODR in full, we're not seeing it as readily across the board in international practice because there are far too many clashes of cultures for the system to withstand and deal with it but on a more regional and local basis, it may be even the avenue, the apropos avenue towards efficiency and cost. But uh, without belaboring the point, Kabir, please, insights on ODR. I put a nice virtual background for you now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, Nick, I think you explained it very nicely. You know, we are told always, right, it's better to be silent and perceived to be a fool than to open your mouth and clear doubts. I think you've explained it nicely. So I will, I will be silent and let your wisdom percolate. You know, in the chat function, I like this comment very much, right? This idea of trust, fully capitalized. Yeah, yeah. How, how do you maintain trust? It's a question we ask ourselves always, right? It's why we're using now 365 degree cameras because we do not trust or we're making in big fanfare witnesses open FedEx documents, uh, you know, on the screen. Here it is. I didn't tamper with this document. 
how do we how do we maintain the trust? And frankly, it's really going to depend on counsel involved to help regulate that. You know, there are good and bad lawyers, much like they're good and bad witnesses. And it's up to us if we want to really invest faith and trust in the system to show that we can do it um, and that we can do it well. And I don't think we're there yet, but I am so hopeful that we could be there soon. And frankly, if we're not there soon and we're still talking about the same discussion in one year's time, I posit you we failed the system towards best practices. If I may just take two very quick points that have come up that I think are good points. Is ODR ideal for high stake disputes? That's a query that has come up. And the other question is security. Because I think they're really, these two questions are really getting to the heart of the debate. Uh, in very high stake, complex disputes uh, involving multiple parties, imagine a case where you have a party from Australia and a council from the United States. We're moving from one end of the world to the other end of the world. Uh, the hearing is going to be a nightmare. Somebody is going to have to stay up all night and that's never fun. Uh, we yet don't have perfect answers for that. Now, one of, my, one of my colleagues at work just had a hearing and she told us that you know, her hearing involved parties from the West Coast and Singapore. And the hearing, the final compromise was that they were going to have a hearing every day for three hours. Now, if you do the math, as opposed to doing it for eight hours, you're doing it for three hours. That means you're going to have to have it for many, many more days. That is a challenge. We have to see how we're going to address that. But I do think, you know, we like to talk about high value disputes because they really bring the focus to some of these issues to the forefront. The reality is most disputes are not high value. So, you know, I put both these thoughts there because I do think the question is touching to a very sensitive issue. Perhaps we treat the high value disputes differently from regular disputes. <laughs> Recognizing high value and regular disputes, the terms depend on how you define them, but take them for what they are. Security, that is a problem. Try to use common sense security measures. If people send you something that looks and sounds suspicious, don't use it, don't open it. We're told, <laughs> you know, don't, don't use emails. You're told actually to use Dropbox and told to use Dropbox like functions to exchange documents. If you see an email that sounds too good to be true, hey, I'm going to give you a million dollars. If you <laughs> click on this link, don't click on it. Uh, it is one of those things all of us have at some stage fallen prey to, no matter whether we admit it or not. But, you know, we have to keep our antennas up and try to improve the way we do things. I, I think I'll stop here in the interest of time. I know it's late in India. I wanted to uh, just add one quick point that came up. Um, I've been seeing in procedural orders by arbitrators. Um, when we talk about optionality and being adept in optionality, for example, even in Zoom, I've started seeing they will take all of the options, almost like a screenshot, um, and they will say specifically, this, is this option is on, this option is off, this option is on, because we don't want any um, lack of clarity in what both sides are understanding, what we can export. Is the chat function able to be exported? Is this, is that? And so, you know, we all say it. Oh, look at the functions we have, for example, in Zoom. There are so many and they keep adding new functionality all the time. I feel like I get an email from Zoom every two weeks <laughs> and I delete it, right? But when you need it, and we're talking about in an ODR platform and we're using Zoom as only one example, Kabir and I take no kickbacks from Zoom, but like, what, what are, how are we staying top of mind with all of the nuances that are being developed in real time? And so consider it, even as you're moving into your mediations and arbitrations on an online platform, how clear are you as the decision maker to the parties and to counsel? These are all of the options. This is what we're doing. I want to be sure that you're clear and so here is your screenshot. Towards best practices, just something to think about because I had never seen that before and I was 
so intrigued. <laughs> that to back to our organizers, Kabir and I are just so thrilled. It's yeah. it's now uh, twenty minutes over our time, and we're still here with you. And we can't <laughs> we can't thank you enough. We we know we may have uh, <laughs> we may have droned on a bit, and you have been so kind to give us the platform um, to to the CNICA and to our organizers. Uh, it's really good fun, and frankly, now Kabir and I are caffeinated, so we're, we're ready to start our days. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, we need to say this. Uh, you have made my work uh, absolutely easy uh, by moderating all the uh, questions, and the entire session was absolutely, absolutely live, and uh, it was a live wire, I can say, and the comments which have come in the chat box, amazing. We have never seen such comments at all, and that was great. Uh, before I uh, go to the, uh, I mean, uh, we have our vote of thanks, uh, formal vote of thanks and summation of the proceedings today. Uh, it will be given by Ritika. I have uh, unmuted you. Please, uh, Ritika, you can come back. Ritika, I think you've muted yourself. Yeah, you've unmuted yourself now. Hi. Um, thank you for today's session and uh, basically to summarize the session for today, our speakers spoke about virtual hearings and the usage of technology within international arbitration, the pros and cons. We looked at the example of Bolivia and Peru with respect to the claims raised in, raised in late light of the pandemic and the possibility of disputes within in investment treaty arbitrations and why moratoriums should be granted. Our speakers today also elucidated the potential challenges in using ODR for arbitration and mediation and concluded with uh, some communication. So I would really like to thank you all for being a part of today's session, attending it from different parts of the world. I would like to thank our speakers, Ms. Rekha Rangachari and Dr. Kabir Dukal for their insightful and extremely lively session on today's topic, ODR for ADR. Today's topic is quite necessary and uh, I for one enjoyed it thoroughly, especially looking at the gist on the slide set and along with the discussion itself. Uh, one look at the chat box could uh, tell that every, other, every participant in today's session also thoroughly enjoyed today's session. I would also like to extend my thanks to Seneca for organizing the session and giving me the opportunity to render the vote of thanks for the day. Have a nice rest of the day. Thank you, Ritika. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And uh, one short announcement we have uh, the next week, that is uh, on 3rd of July 2020, we will be having Mr. Ramanathan Chinaya, uh, who will be addressing on a uh, forward on the amalgamation of artificial intelligence and international arbitration. How AI is getting into arbitration is be will be discussed. And thanks one and all for your uh, being present. And thanks a lot for the speakers for being present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.